afternoon. With that, it's maybe a good indication that companies are thinking about disruption, and that'll be my transition to Professor Robert Brunner at the Geese College of Business. His title is Associate Dean for Innovation and the Chief Disruption Officer, but if I look through his whole bio, you would see that there are many more titles that he holds. The first um, title that, that we got to, to work with him in was over here at the Research Park as a data science expert in residence, but since then he has continued to spread his wings all across campus. So his appointments include now the Department of Accountancy, which has really uh, changed the way it thinks about, I think, hires as one of our preeminent departments academically at the university, but also changing quickly. He has appointments that also span astronomy, computer science, electrical and computer engineering, informatics, physics, statistics, the Beckman Institute, and NCSA. So that's quite a handful of different appointments that give you some indication of how prolific the needs are for data science and disruption expertise. With that, welcome, Robert Brenner. I, I, I just have to say, Lara, um, I was wondering, you know, I, I'm starting a, a few minutes early, but I, I see that we, you're filling it by talking about me. I, I actually thought you might say, uh, uh, sometimes I'm the uh, Enterprise Works astrologer, uh, just as another uh, example. Um, I also just want to say, I, I, I posted in the, the chat, uh, no asteroid so far, I'd shared my my slides with uh, uh, the uh, enterprise staff, uh, specifically Desiree, because you know I was like, well, you know, if the internet goes out here, I'm I'm at home. I wanted to make sure we would we would be able to, to work. That's 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 what a disruption officer does, I guess. Um, so I was just saying, no asteroid so far. We're good to go. Um, but yes, this is this is a unusual uh, time that we're doing this. I'm so excited that that the research park could do this summit. I've been involved for a number of years, and I think this is always a great event. And uh, you know, with COVID, it was it was a concern, but I'm glad we're able to do it. Um, and just just in terms of disruption, I don't think I've ever given a talk wearing headphones. Um, but you know, when I'm here at home and I have uh, kids that are that are uh, in college and they're taking courses, um, and two dogs that wander around. Um, uh, you know, you never know. So we we have to we have to adjust and 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 be be nimble and flexible. So uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Um, let me make sure I do this right. Uh, Ready here. Hopefully this is okay and you're you're able to see my slides. Not yet. Right. You can't see them yet. Uh, oh, I got a quick share. There we go. How's that? Great. All right. Excellent. Uh, so. So here we are, um, you know, and I'm, I'm definitely a different talk for the rest of the day and, and previous ones as well, but I wanted to sort of wrap this in, you know, why would I be interested in talking here today and, 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 and sort of communicating with all of you. I wanted to, to first emphasize, you know, the last effort or the last group that talked was um, an, enter, an entrepreneurship panel. And I think that that's appropriate that I follow them. Uh, because obviously startups are very much working on the edge of innovation. And to me, that's really where, uh, you know, disruption is occurring. Uh, and, and so I think that's appropriate. And I think just looking at a lot of the, the, the various talks that have gone on, we've seen this transition from, you know, big data, what it used to be to, to where we are now. And, and, and I think that's something to emphasize. But the, the first thing I wanted to sort of to hit on here was, was this, this image, um, you know, you, you know, bull rider, if you're not familiar, uh, you know, a lot of states, uh, bull riding is a big sport. You know, this, this bull, it's, it's uh, uh, not a very uh, tame animal. Uh, and so the, the goal is to try to ride it for like eight seconds. And it may seem really easy, but it's really hard. And I think that's what you face as, as a startup or in a lot of cases when you're working in the technology field. And, and so for me, you know, this is how I look at this. This is, you know, the bull is disruptive technology. And our goal is to try to, to, to manage it. And, and notice I said manage, not master. And, and that really is the, the key point here. We're not trying to master that. And I'm gonna uh, emphasize this repeatedly through, through my talk today. Uh, it's really about trying to manage it and trying to understand what the opportunities are and, and from the range of opportunities, what are the things that we really should pursue? So what am I gonna do uh, in this talk? It's not, it's not that long, um, but I just wanted to first give a little bit of a background. I mean. Uh, Laura did a great job of, of giving an inter introduction to me, but I want to talk a little bit about where I'm coming from and, and sort of what I'm thinking about around disruption, uh, what the College of Business is, is thinking about around disruption, 
Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the whole process. Um, it turns out there really isn't an academic field of, of disruption. I know that's, that's shocking. People don't graduate with a BS or a PhD in disruption, um, at least not formally, perhaps informally. Um, so so what, what does it mean to manage disruption? How, how do we sort of approach that? And this is actually uh, something that I'm approaching as an academic. What does that mean? And how do we think about uh, teaching this and, and doing research in this area? Uh, the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to do a couple of case studies. One about big data. Um, obviously, that's very relevant for today's uh, seminar, this this big data summit. Uh, and then I'm going to do another one around a higher ed, just just to do these to sort of emphasize how we approach this idea of managing disruption and disruptive technology, uh, you know, in, in today's world. So first, uh, as Laura said, I'm, I'm the Associate Dean for Innovation, Chief Disruption Officer. I, I'm currently a professor in accountancy, um, but I used to be a professor of, of astrophysics. Uh, you know, so, so I've had a, a, a long career that moved around. I um, also do some consulting, both for my own company as well as here at the Research Park, um, which has been a fantastic experience. And if a company wants to, to talk about data, wants to talk about disruption innovation, I, I love to do that and would encourage you to reach out and, and set up a, a conversation. Uh, to me, that's really where we really learn what's going on um, and, and start thinking deeply about the opportunities. All right, so before we go any farther, I think it's, it's important to address the elephant in the room and that is disruption. Um, I think there's a history when people hear the word disruption to focus on a certain aspect of disruption. And a good example of that is, is this graphic here. It's the disruptive student. When, when I, I mention disruption or I tell people I'm the chief disruption officer, I don't know if this is what they think. I do in meetings and I throw, throw te temper tantrums and I, I scream and I yell. Um, I, I don't uh, generally, uh, but, but the key thing here is that when you look at this, you see a student who is, is potentially misbehaving, is maybe causing distractions, and, and that's the typical view people have of disruption. But I think that if we take a step back and we, we look at this picture and we think not, oh great, here's this disruption student, it's gonna make life really hard today. Instead think why, why is this student being disruptive? It might simply be that the student is bored. The student already understands the material and doesn't understand why you know, we're still, you know, still diving into this and it's taking so long. Uh, it might be that the student doesn't understand and we need to actually take a step back and make sure that we've brought the student up to speed. Uh, but if we never take that step and really think why, why is this happening? What, what is the, the, the genesis of this? Um, what might be opportunities from this that we could address the situation you, you, if you start going down this path, you take something which is potentially very negative, this disruptive student, maybe uh, disturbing the entire class, causing others to lose focus, and maybe turn it into an opportunity to change the, the viewpoint, the thinking, the, the overall outcome for the entire class. So I think that's sort of the key, key to keep in mind that disruption is not a negative thing. It doesn't, certainly doesn't have to be a negative thing. It's really something that provides that opportunity to think deeply about what's going on, what we see in the world and where we might wanna go with it. So the next question then is, okay, disruption, you say it's, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's potentially a good thing. We have to think about this a little bit differently, but, but what is this chief disruption officer? Um, I mean, sometimes when I, when I first had this role, this is, I'm almost done with two years. Um, it's been about two years now for being the chief disruption officer for the College of Business. Uh, at first, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I sort of would just go by the CDO acronym um, because, you know, oh, CDO, well, people would think, oh, that's chief data officer or something like that um, and not chief disruption. Um, but now I sort of wear it, no, it's, it's a badge of pride, right? I'm a chief disruption officer. There's not a whole lot of them in the world, um, certainly not at, at academic institutions. So what, is it, what does it mean? So if I, if I say, well, before COVID, if I said I'm a chief disruption officer, people would be like, well, what do you do? What, what is it that you do? What, what were they thinking making a chief disruption officer, you know, not just for a company, but for a college of business at the University of Illinois? What, what is this? What are you, what are you doing? Um, but now I think it's changed. It's more, well, what don't you do? And you know, this is one of those things that the pandemic obviously is a very negative thing. I don't mean to act like it's not, but the disruption it's caused has created so many business opportunities. It's changed the way we approach so much of what we do every day that now people are very open to this idea and thinking about, well, you know what, disruption is all around us. We, 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 can't, get, we can't even open our front door and not be confronted with disruption. 
uh, just again, take this conference, right? This conference is virtually, it's online. Um, we have people from all over participating. Uh, I'm having to wear headphones as I present. I have a dog sitting under my desk as I'm presenting. You know, I've never done this before. This is very much a very different situation. And I think that's the, the, the point here. It really does change how we can approach things and do things. So as a chief disruption officer, what, what do I really think about? Well, the number one thing is data. And, and I don't mean to, to sidestep that issue at all. Obviously, this is the big data summit, and there are a, a lot of things that happen around data. Um, the College of Business in particular has pivoted and really thinking deeply about data and data analytics and all the things we learn from data, all the things that go along with it, about to launch a new, a new program in MS and business analytics. Uh, so data is really extremely important. But I think that if we just stopped there, we actually miss a lot. Uh, to me, you know, where the, the real sort of over the, the hill, the, where the horizon, where we really want to look is, is the technologies that are coming out. Um, Chin Mei made a point in the last panel about, you know, when you're a startup, you got to think about next quarter. And I, and I thought that was great. Um, and I totally understand that. Um, I have the benefit of not being a startup, right? I'm at an academic institution, so I can really think. In fact, I'm encouraged to be thinking long term. So I like to think about technology and what's coming and, and maybe what are the things that we need to start thinking about, not just the current technology, not just about data, but maybe what are we going to be able to do with these things and how will it change different industries? I really like the poll question that popped up uh, in the last panel. Um, I clicked education, just in full disclosure, because I think that education is going to be an industry that's, that's right. But, but it was great to see this, the respondents split so, so evenly across those to see, you know, look, there's potential for disruption across so many areas that it really is exciting. Um, yep, <laughs> there, there we go, right? There's the, there's the poll results. Um, the third thing I wanted to, to emphasize is innovation. Uh, you know, innovation is something that I think we're all striving to be. Uh, we want to be innovative. We want to emphasize the, 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 that we're always looking forward to change, to positive change, to impacting things positively. Uh, and that's, that's, of course, important. One thing that I, I should emphasize is that, you know, I'm not the first to, to think about disruption in terms of, uh, you know, an academic thinking about analyzing industries in this space. Um, there's a, a long history of this. Uh, one of the most famous is, of course, Clayton Christensen, who came up with the term disruptive innovation. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at that as well, but, but I'm thinking about it a little more practically than that in, in many cases. What are the technologies that really are gonna be changing things and how do, we, how do we promote those and push those forward and teach our students about them? Uh, and then the last thing of course is entrepreneurship. And, and you know, this, this slide was done before I knew I was following a, a, an entrepreneurship panel, but I, I do think it's very important because whether we're entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, it's important to be thinking about what are the ways that we want to bring innovation into uh, you know, the solving business problems, the solving real world problems. Um, and I think entrepreneurs, it's, it's such a great and exciting area to, to be working in. Um, you know, inside the College of Business, I, I lead a unit called Disruption and Innovation. Um, and this, this, this unit runs the experiential learning programs where we bring companies and projects into the classroom and students work on these. Um, I run the entrepreneurship programs out of the college. Um, we have a data science consultancy uh, organization. Right now it focuses mostly on faculty research, but we're looking to expand that. Uh, there's the HEF technology management program, which is a minor that's joint between the College of Engineering and, and the College of Business. Uh, we're launching this new thing called the Disruption Lab. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And there's, there's, there's other things in there. But again, I just wanted to put this up to sort of as that background, really, really working in the areas of technology and innovation and entrepreneurship and data, really thinking about how the, the business landscape is, is changing and is, is going to be changing in the future. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was managing disruption. Um, and, and again, this is not a you know, a, a four step or a six step or a 10 step program that, that you can do. It really is a, at this stage, more of an art than anything. Um, and so some of the key aspects that, that I work on in this area and think about, um, it starts with strategic planning. You know, we have to think about where do we want to go, but then we also have to think about in terms of the landscape, whether it's a SWOT analysis or something else, we have to think about in terms of the landscape, what might change in the world? So if I'm going to launch a company and I'm, I'm going to you know, take an ag tech company as, the, as we're several of that on the panel, I might be thinking about the future of ag. Where, where do I think the future of ag might go? And, and for this, I'm going to have to think about a range of scenarios. Uh, and so, you know, the first book I show here, The Art of the Long View, talks a lot about the scenario planning. And you think about 
well, if I'm going to worry about ag and I'm going to worry about 10, 20, 30 years into the future, I obviously have to think about climate change and the impact of climate change on agriculture. Another big thing I would have to think about is, is world population. How is world population going to change and how is that going to drive demand or changes in demand? Uh, how will demographics change and evolve so that I might understand, will there be differences in thoughts in terms of what agricultural products we might want or might want to make? Um, so when we think about these sort of macro issues, that allows us to build out scenarios for what might happen in the future. And when we do this, we typically want to say limited to a small number, three, four, five different scenarios that might come out. And then the next step is to think about, well, what is the likelihood of each of these different scenarios? And that's where we start thinking about risk management and assigning probabilities. Um, you know, we may have one scenario that, that is very rosy, um, you know, climate change is, is controlled and world population is controlled. And so it's going to stay, stay the same. And that might be one scenario. A different scenario might be drastically different. Um, and so we have to think about this. How likely are these different scenarios? How complex are they? Uh, one key thing I, I do want to make a point of when we do these scenarios, we don't say we're trying to be absolutely right. In fact, that's the wrong approach. Um, because you're almost guaranteed to never be right in this plan. What you want to do is minimize the likelihood of being wrong. You want your, your, your scenarios to not be wrong, um, to be as correct as possible, I guess is, a, is another way of looking at it. So with risk management, we're going to break out what are the different ways, the different probabilities of these things might happen. Um, but it's not good enough to just do that because if we just say, well, this is a really high, high likelihood event, we may not want to care or may not care about that event because the utility or the uh, impact that's going to have on our decision making is minimal. Okay, so for instance, if uh, we come up with a, a very low probability event, but it would kill our company if it happens, then that's an extremely important thing to be thinking about. And that's the ideas behind decision theory when we think about you making a measurement of utility. I like to think about this as the dinosaur killer, right? I mean, if you knew an asteroid, um, not to bring the asteroids back in, but if we, if we knew an asteroid was gonna hit and it had the potential to wipe out civilization, we would be very concerned with that. And we would wanna make sure we mitigate that, that risk. Um, and so again, that's where the importance of this coming in, um, not just the probability, but the utility. And then the last thing is emerging technology. We really have to stay uh, uh, on top of this. And I just give an example of Thomas Siebel's book, Digital Transformation, a great introduction to, to thinking about uh, these things. Um, you know, but there's lots of technologies that are like this. And that's what's so impressive and so important to attend events like today's Big Data Summit, where you get to expose to not just big data, but to all the different things and ways that people are learning from data and the applications they can have. Um, so this is sort of the, the, the groundwork, the foundation of where we go with this. Um, you know, we actually have a class, um, Emerging Technology and Disruption. This is helping to formulate a lot of these ideas where we teach, you know, th this, this process of scenario planning and then thinking about different technologies and how they might impact. Um, I really like that, the ideas behind Reconstruct. I think that's a really interesting, um, just to pick on one, one startup that I was listening to, um, you know, thinking about the construction industry, which I'm not too familiar with, but of course, walk past or drive past uh, all the construction going past on campus and you see it and it's how it changes over time. It's really interesting to me to think about how data and technology are, are changing those processes and, and allowing people to think about things differently. And of course, um, you know, the ag tech, another very big area here in Champaign-Urbana in terms of thinking about startups and, and the opportunities. Uh, again, a lot of opportunities there. But, but thinking about how machine learning, how drones, chatbots, augmented virtual reality, blockchain, remote sensing, artificial intelligence, how these technologies are coming around and how they might change or impact a specific industry. Um, I think that's really exciting, and I really like to do that. So let's 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 just do a little walkthrough here. Let's let's apply these ideas uh, that I just mentioned. Um, so let's take big data case study. Where were we five to ten years ago? And and I'll probably focus more on the five years ago. Uh, my memory is not as good uh, as as it used to be. So let's say let's say five years. When we think about big data, um, obviously one of the big things that comes out are the V's, the V's of big data, um, and it started with three. Um, and if I remember right, it was volume, the size of the data, velocity, the speed of the data, and V variety, um, the different types of data. Those were the initial threes. Um, we heard over launch of the keynote, um, he introduced veracity as, a, as sort of the fourth V. Um, later on, he mentioned visualization as another V. Um, two other Vs that sometimes people talk about are value, what's the value of, of that big data, and, and another one is variability, data that might be changing, and the meaning of the data that might be changing. This is what we used to think about in terms of, of big data. If we went to a big data summit uh, you know, five years ago, that, that might be uh, some things people were talking about. The other big thing was, you know, how do we derive insights? You know, machine learning, how do we, how do we 
pull these data out? Where are the data? Um, what would we store? Where would we store the data? And, and I think a great example of this is, what was the agenda like for the Big Data Summit uh, in 2016? And if you look at that, it's probably a lot about the, the, the seven Vs, three Vs, whatever, you know, how do, we, how do we apply deep learning? What is deep learning? What might we do with it? Cloud computing, we talked a lot about cloud computing. Um, you know, but now, you know, if I, if I take a step back and say, well, if we could transport back five years, what should we have focused on five years ago, right? Rather than thinking about all those things we were worrying about, how do we store the data? How do we move the data? How do we, you know, run an algorithm against the data? You know, if, if we would have taken a step back and thought, you know, cloud computing, it, it existed back then. And if we, we really thought about it, we said, you know, we probably should be really focusing on cloud computing is going to exist. So we don't worry about storing the data or moving it, not nearly as much as we may have maybe used to. Uh, another thing is automation. Automation's here, right? Everything's getting automated and, and, and stuff is easier, whether it's RPA or whether it's something else. Uh, there, we don't have to do a lot of these mundane tasks so much. Um, visualization is much easier than it used to be. And we even now have automated, automated uh, machine learning uh, tools like uh, you know, Data Robot. And again, if you just look at today's agenda for the summit, you'll see that. Right? We don't have a cloud computing panel, and, and I, could, I could say this because I didn't help create the agenda for this. We don't have that, that, that panel. I mean, if, if, I, if I look at it, you know, we have, we have sessions talking about COVID, uh, machine learning, networks, uh, the entrepreneurships, IoT, um, biases in data, big data that Jana Diesner talked about. Um, you know, when you just look at all these different aspects, we're not worrying about data or even big data. And in fact, we might say, if we go five years in the future, Maybe the summit's not even called big data. Maybe it's called something else. You know, uh, disruption, innovation, technology, entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, I don't know, some 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 mess of those those acronyms or something. But that sort of just emphasizes how we sometimes get caught in the little details that are right in front of us and don't don't think about over that horizon what might be coming. All right, so we did one, one little case study. Let's try another one. Let's think about higher ed. I'm a, a professor with Associate Dean of Innovation here, so so I think about this a lot. Um, and I think about, well, what's coming after COVID, right? I'm going to be optimistic. We're going to get through this. There'll be a vaccine. Things will come, will come out of this. Uh, you know, a year from now, Big Data Summit is taking place at the new big uh, conference center next to the iHotel. So what do we have? Well, right now, if you think about it, we've got Zoom, right? We're using Zoom right now uh, in ways that maybe we never would have thought of. Um, I, I should take note here that the College of Business has been using Zoom for years. Um, in our online programs, we've used Zoom for, for years to teach our IMBA, our IMSA, our new IMSM program. These are our online programs. Uh, we have over 4,000 students in these programs right now, and it's going to uh, uh, probably double, uh, at least double within a year. Um, the pace is tremendous. So obviously, we're doing something, we're doing it very well. In fact, our IMBA was voted the number one most disruptive uh, thing in business school, business education uh, over the last decade. Uh, so it shows the impact uh, and power of that approach, uh, it's, which is great, right? But I don't think any of us are going to say, we like big data um, done this way, the big data summit done this way, you know, over, over slides where Robert's wearing a headphone and, and he's got, well, you might like to know my dogs here. Um, people like dogs, but, um, you know, surely we could do better. So, so when I stop this and I think, well, what, what is going on? Well, I see Walmart is training their floor staff using VR, right? So that they all get the same training, the same knowledge of how to handle difficult situations like an unruly customer or a spill in the floor, different types of spills. What do you do? Um, you know, they're doing this. Now, they're a large company. They can, they can have the resources to do this. But to me, that's really interesting. We don't do this. We don't train our students using VR. We don't even really think about uh, doing much of this. There's, there's a few efforts that are going forward on campus, uh, like in archaeology. Uh, but what might we think about more boldly there? Um, another interesting thing is there's a lot of startups working in this space. Here's a, a, a one from Tailspin, um, which is a company I've, I've, I've done a little bit of work with and an and area we want to do more of doing basic HR training with VR. How do you train people to fire people, hire people, um, talk, have difficult conversations? These are things that are really challenging. And if you don't give somebody that actual experience, it can be very difficult for them. So I, I look at these technologies and I think this, this is interesting, um, but maybe we go even beyond this. Maybe we go beyond VR and think about holograms. What if professors were teaching in classrooms that are, that are holographically displayed around the world? Um, you know, that, that's interesting. And, and maybe it sounds a little crazy, um, but, you know, it's not like I just made this up. Uh, this was made up in Star Wars, right? We had the Jedi Council. They're connected all over the place. 
Um, and not that I'm comparing myself to a Jedi master, but you know, you think about, about this idea of bringing people, students, faculty, teachers, whoever, into a room, into a, a room where people physically and virtually are there together without wearing, um, say, a VR goggles, that's a really powerful way to imagine the classroom of the future. And, and so that's what I think about. And, and I don't know, is this five years? Is this 10 years? Is this 25? Is this never? Um, but this is a sort of example of how you think about technology and where it may go and where it may push your, your, uh, your company and your industry forward. And I think that's where I really want to, to sort of push that point. We're not saying this is the future, but this is a possible future. And even if it doesn't come completely true, it allows us to think about this whole aspect, this whole approach in a way that we can see the opportunities uh, to really have a meaningful uh, conversation around what that future of higher education might be or what the future of X might be. And this is really where, where I sort of spend most of my time. Um, I told you I'd talk a little bit about this disruption lab. We're launching this disruption lab. Um, it's the only disruption lab in the College of Business uh, that, that, I, that I know about any disruption lab anywhere. Um, and, and fundamentally, the, the thought here is it's one thing to do the thought process. It's one thing to think about, here's all the technology. Where might it go? What might it do to impact a, a particular industry? And that's like, you know, as an example, what we do in that class that I was talking about. We'll, we'll pick a, an industry, we'll pick construction, we'll pick finance, we'll pick agriculture. We, we think about different technologies, how they might change things. And that's, that's really useful. It helps us get sort of these basic scenarios, what might happen. But at the end of the day, the most powerful way to do this is to build a prototype. Um, so if we're thinking about how might we do virtual reality um, and teaching a particular business topic, and I'll pick one, we'll say tax. Um, most people are not interested in learning tax, particularly just looking at the IRS tax code and, and going through it. So what, what might we want to do there? Well, an example is you might think about, well, when you're talking about tax, you have to worry about depreciation schedules. And that means actual different types of environments, different types of objects, say, say that you're going to be depreciating. How might you interact with these in a way that's a little more stimulating, a little bit more, um, uh, you know, sort of simplify the understanding of how different depreciation schedules might impact things? Uh, and so what we did is we, we, we built a VR simulator that, that sort of explored this and allowed somebody to go into a particular environment and interact with different objects, uh, furniture, uh, et cetera, and think about, well, if I depreciated it this way, it would do this. If I depreciated it this way, I'd do this. And everything is right there. So you see and interact with everything in that manner. And obviously that's a rather disruptive thing to think about tax, tax education, and, and sort of bringing it uh, in, into the classroom differently by using VR. Uh, but we're doing this in a lot of areas with blockchain, with AI, with augmentation. I think those things are all really big. The, the last thing I wanted to, or the next thing I wanted to mention was thought leadership. I think this is, is really important. And, and it's really a little odd to say thought leadership around disruption because you know, disruption is so new and it's so different. How do you, how do, you do thought leadership? But, but a large part of it is just doing things like this, talking about what we're doing, but mostly listening to others and hearing what, what, are their, what are they thinking? That's why creating this class that I mentioned earlier was so important because to me, this gives me the chance to interact with students and to hear what do they think about these technologies changing and impacting a particular industry. Um, I, I may be you know, thinking about certain things, but students are gonna be thinking about things very differently. And a, and a great example is social media. I, I don't do a whole lot on social media, but students do a lot more on social media than I do. And they use platforms that I may not have even heard of and so it gives me the uh, opportunity to learn from them what maybe the future would be like for their generation in 10, 20 years and not just you know, my generation. So I think it's important to be doing this. And again, thought leadership is important. It's sharing what we learn. It's, it's learning from others, building that community. Um, and another important thing that we're, we're exploring is, is doing this with companies, that same idea. Um, we're not gonna bring a company in and, and have them all take this the same course, although people can do these courses online. Uh, but we want to work with companies to understand, um, either in a private setting or in a public setting, what are the challenges that they see? What are the disruptions that they're worried about? What are the innovations that, that may be coming that they sort of, yeah, this is probably going to be important for us, but we're not really sure how it might play out or what we need to be doing in this scenario. And so we're starting to explore this with, with some companies. Again, the Disruption Lab is, is just about to go public. Um, it's been operating in a stealth mode, uh, particularly around building prototypes and student projects for about a year now. 
but we should be going uh, public uh, either later this uh, academic semester or early next academic semester and uh, invite everybody to who's curious or wants to learn more just to, to reach out to talk to me to, to, to let me know if you're interested. We're happy to get more partners. Uh, but this is kind of a high level overview of that. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop. I just want to thank you. Uh, think about disruptors for, for good. Um, if you want to reach out to me, uh, you can use my email. Um, and, and of course, Laura knows how to get a hold of me as well. And, uh, and I'm here to answer some questions if there are any. No, that's not the email address for the dog under your table. It's actually for you. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy one to remember if you want to reach Robert Brunner, bigdog at illinois.edu. I put the link to what is, I guess, supposed to be secret disruption lab, but it's out there, Robert. So uh, I used the Google machine and found it. Um, <laughs> so uh, just kind of question about the students. And I think you talked about how higher education is really changing. Um, we have moved to increasingly online delivery, but we're also changing the curriculum at the same time this year. How has Geese been able to respond to both different mechanisms for delivery, but also this hybrid nature of the types of training that we're doing, not just accounting or not just traditional business, but increasingly making them data oriented students too? That's a great question, Lara. Um... You know, I, I think everybody, you know, it, well, for, first let me take a step back. We're, we're in this difficult time. We're all in this difficult time together. And, you know, it is obviously having challenges on uh, each of us, on those we work with, on our staffs, um, and just encourage everyone to reach out to those you work with and make sure that, that they're okay. Um, it, it is so hard to to really understand what people are going through, you know, when you aren't there physically, um, you know, and, and many of you have probably heard Zoom fatigue, right? And then people whose studies have shown it's a real thing. And it's a large part because we don't have that ability to, uh, to easily be empathetic with people over, over video, right? It's like watching TV or a movie, right? I mean, you know, how do you have empathy for, you know, that movie star or whatever? Um, so, so I want to emphasize that. In terms of what the college is doing, you know, we we actually were were pretty well positioned for this this uh, uh, sudden change. You know, we have a very big e-learning team. We were leaders on campus uh, on uh, e-learning, online learning. Um, you know, because of the IMBA, and we've been building this up. A lot of our faculty had taught online already. Uh, so when it came time to pivot and think about, okay, you know, it was I still remember this the week before spring break, um, being in a meeting with uh, Dean Brown. Um, and being like, you know, we, we may we may be having some real issues. And then, you know, like a week later, it's like, oh, they're here, right? I mean, <laughs> the, the real issues are here. We got to pivot. Um, and, you know, we're going to we're gonna go online. We actually went hybrid for one week before spring break, and then we're, we're, we're obviously online after spring break. So we were able to pivot, not painlessly, but, but, but better than maybe most, um, and to leverage that technology. And because of that, that meant that we could be thinking a little more proactively for the fall when we had a little more time. And now the spring, we have a little more time to prepare. So we have a lot of, of thoughts around this, reusing content, um, make, having our, our, our faculty not think about the traditional lecture, just moving it online, think about recorded videos, uh, thinking about more peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, examples like that, using resources that perhaps we might not have used in the past. So I think that's that's probably the biggest thing. And then sort of sharing those in that thought leadership uh, model that I talked about earlier, sharing those more broadly with uh, our, our fellow uh, faculty and, and staff across campus. Uh, 